before we get started, um, we have a book up there called Islam and Terrorism, and I told a little bit about it, how I came to understand that book. A, a brother in Paris here recently <coughs> told me about it, and then he mailed it to me, and I read it. And uh, one of the things that we, under, that we teach, that we believe, is that the third woe is the issue that pr produces the environment in the United States to bring the Sunday law. And we, we understand that the third woe is the activities of radical Islam. And in the Protestant world and even in Adventism, and in particular in the secular news throughout the world, there's a teaching that there is a certain a majority or a, a, a large group of people in Islam that relate to the Quran in a peaceful fashion. I mean, that, that Islam can be a peaceful religion. And, but in spite of that, and not necessarily contradicting that, but what we're emphasizing is that what is being conveyed prophetically about Islam in the third woe is that they bring a crisis in the world that only continues to escalate. 9-11 was a, a line in the sand saying the third woe has arrived, but it's going to continue to escalate and escalate and escalate. This book is written by a university professor at a university that is the premier uh, university in Islam. When they have questions on the Quran in Islam anywhere in the world, they would write this university, and the man that wrote this book was a professor there. He tells his story in here. By 12 years old, he had the Quran memorized. And wh when I read this book, I told my daughter, who works with us in Arkansas, about this book. I said, you need to read it. So one of the things she did... Uh, my son-in-law and her surfed the web for stuff. She first went on the web to see if this author was, if this was real, you know, if this wasn't some just con artist that was trying to make money. And everything he says about himself, you can confirm on the web. Even the people that disagree with his conclusions or disagree with his ideas acknowledge that he really was this professor and that his background in history is all accurate. And one of the main things in this book that is, that is important, I already mentioned this, but I want to mention it again, is that, there's a, that in Islam, they relate to inspiration different than we do. And they believe, if they were dealing with the Bible instead of the Quran, the, their rule is that the last statement on a subject is the, the point of reference. And if, if a subject is mentioned three times in the Quran and those three times disagree with each other, it's the final statement that is what is to be understand, is understood in truth. And he goes sh through and shows that, the, that Islam, its only purpose is to convert the entire world to the Muslim religion. And, that, and there was a man, and he, we all know of him here in the United States, he's in prison now, he's the, the blind sheikh that participated in the first attack on the the Twin Towers, uh, I forget his name, but you know the guy that's in prison, the blind, you've all heard about him on the news, right? The first time they tried to blow up the, the Trade Center in New York, he was the guy behind it, and he's in prison for life. Well, he, he first assassinated, I think it was a prime minister in Egypt, and he was from Egypt, and he was a cleric in Egypt, and Egypt is a Muslim country. So he tells the story of this sheik that assassinated the prime minister in Egypt, and tells about his trial. And this, this man that's in prison here now in Egypt, he went into the courts in Egypt. He says, you are an Islamic country, which means you are to be governed by the Koran. And he used the Koran to demonstrate that he had the right to kill this prime minister because he wasn't in agreement with the Koran, and he was let off. The Koran allows and teaches that every Muslim has the responsibility to bring the, bring the world under the control of Islam. And so when you're, when you're teaching that the third woe is Islam and that this crisis is only going to escalate, you need to be clear, the Koran is not a book of peace. And he will tell you why that is the case. That, that's why uh, this book seems significant to me. Now, <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us back um, together this morning, we ask that once again you would grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit and your angels, and that you would guide and direct in the subjects that we're going to consider at this time. We thank you 
in advance for blessing us with this light and help us, we pray, to use this light to bring our lives into agreement with the times in which we live and the message of the hour we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're suggesting that at the beginning of the Millerite history in 1798, there was a prophetic truth that was unsealed. That truth, that light that was unsealed, the book of Daniel, was concerning the upcoming epic of sacred history, which was the announcement that the judgment was going to begin. And based upon Great Controversy 343, we've been told that every reformatory movement parallels all the others, so we went through several lines, of, several lines of reformatory movements and demonstrated, hopefully, clearly for everyone, that the same characteristics are in all of these reformatory movements. We did that because the greatest, most important reformatory movement of all time is the 144,000. And because the starting point for a reformatory movement is a fulfillment of a prophecy and then there's an, an unsealing of a prophetic truth that contributes to the upcoming history, we started with Revelation 10, verse 4, where we've seen that the seven thunders were sealed up. And when they were sealed up, if you remember, it was Christ, the angel, that came down, according to Sister White. And when he cried, he cried as a lion, it says. And when he cried, seven thunders uttered his voice, and John was about to write, but he was told, seal up those things with the seven thunders uttered. But the point is, is that when he cried as a lion... The only other place in the book of Revelation where Christ is identified as a lion is in chapter 5. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And when he's the lion of the tribe of Judah, he's representing his work in unsealing the book that's sealed with seven seals. So when you see Christ as the lion in the book of Revelation, whether it's in Revelation 5 or in Revelation 10, it's, it's identifying something about the sealing or the unsealing of prophetic light. And we suggested that just as the book of Daniel was unsealed by the Lion of the tribe of Judah in chapter 5 of Revelation onward in fulfillment of Daniel 12's prediction of seal up the book of Daniel till the time of the end, that the seven thunders were sealed up until Revelation 22.10. So the verse just before the close of probation says, The time is at hand. Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book. So just before the close of probation, whatever the seven thunders are, are to be unsealed. And we're suggesting that the unsealing of the seven thunders will produce the same effect in the history of the 144,000 that the unsealing of the book of Daniel did with the Millerites. And when we looked at what the seven thunders represent, according to Sister White, the truth, the basic truth of what the seven thunders are, she says it represents the delineation of events that took place between 1840 and 1844 during the first and second angel's message, but she says it also represents future events that will be disclosed in their order. And based upon other passages where we are taught that the Millerite history is repeated, such as Daniel 12 and Revelation 14 and Matthew 25, and when dealing with Matthew 25, when Sister White, speaking of the parable of the ten virgins, she says the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, we're suggesting that the future events that will be disclosed in their order, that Sister White's calling the seven thunders, is in agreement with these other passages that the Millerite history is going to be repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. And this is also in agreement with Great Controversy 343, where she says all these reformatory movements parallel one another. So we spent some time bringing these <coughs> lines of prophecy together. And we, at the same time, we were suggesting to uh, you that in the time of the refreshing, Isaiah 28, verse 12, I believe, in the times of refreshing, which is in the latter rain time period, those people that are the other tongue that the Lord is going to speak to his people with, the stammering tongue, that the way that they're going to convey the latter rain message, the final warning message, is by bringing line upon line together from here and from there, precept upon precept. And we're saying that that's what we've been doing here. And in agreement with Isaiah 58.12, where one of the works of those very same people, the 144,000, is that they're going to um, point back to the ancient past to dwell in, that this study 
takes us back to the foundations of Adventism because Isaiah 58, 12 says those people are going to restore the foundations of many generations. And we looked at the generation of Noah, Moses, Elijah, the Nehemiah, Christ, and the Millerites. And all those generations, we see the foundations laid in the period of this first way mark. There's primarily three way marks. We're emphasizing the first, second, third angel's message. <coughs> foundation of the temple laid here. John the Baptist lays the foundational message in his time period. William Miller lays the foundation. So what we're saying here is that when this history is repeated, the work of the 144,000 is to restore the foundations of many generations. And the foundations of Adventism was established in this time period, which is the seven thunders, which were sealed up. So when the seven thunders are unsealed, one of the works is to go back and reacquaint God's people with the foundations of Adventism, which takes us back to here and these truths. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of ways to argue the, the soundness of, of what we've been sharing here. And it's, it, it's a... I hope you've, you've recognized that it's a pretty profound study. But once you have this in place, there's many things you can do with it. And we're, we're beginning now. We've put it in place. Now we're going to draw some of the more serious, I hope, serious conclusions. We started here last night now um, with the subject of Islam, which is just one. It's just one of the lessons that you draw, I believe, that you draw from this once it's in place. And uh, we also pointed that this history is coming to a conclusion scatterings come into occlusion, there's a gathering time, and that there is a scattering that has taken place in Adventism, and it's not an accident that the scattering is the covering up of the foundations, which need to be restored. Uh, they all come together. Um, so, we've also pointed out in these many lines of prophecy that these three way marks have the signature of the work of the Holy Spirit, because the work of the Holy Spirit is three steps to convince the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment to come. And these men that are raised up to give this first message in these histories, they're reformers. Elijah, Noah, Moses, Miller, John the Baptist. They bring, John the Baptist says, repent. Or they bring a message calling for repentance. So we're suggesting that, that in this time period, the message, the prophetic message that comes to light will be a message that is the first step of the work of the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, as we understand it, the prophetic information that we're sharing is this message and what it's teaching from a variety of ways. And, and we have just touched part of this prophetic <coughs> message. We haven't dealt with Daniel 11, Revelation 17, Revelation 13. When you bring it all together, what these lines of prophecy that are all part of this message are teaching is that probation's about to close, okay? And, and, and as Seventh-day Adventists, we're pretty familiar that the reform message for Adventism at the end of the world, it's illustrated a lot of places, but the classic place is the Laodicean church. And my favorite passage in the spirit of prophecy where Sister White's commenting on the Laodicean condition, she says something like this. This is pretty close to it. She says, the greatest deception that can come on upon, upon a human mind is to think that everything's all right when everything is all wrong. And she's saying this is the Laodicean condition. So what I'm saying is that here at the end of the world, don't have it in front of me, but it's there. If, if, if you type in everything's all right, all wrong, you'll pull it up. Um, I have it, but it's not one of those verses, passages that I know right where to go to get it. Um, but that, that's where we're at. And, and, and the problem with that, and I said this earlier on, I believe this, whether it's true or not, you'll have to judge. The thing that prevents you and I from being revived is our unwillingness to admit that we're spiritually dead. And it's, it's, easy, it's easy for me to visit a, an Adventist church that has uh, the rock and roll drums and the rock and roll guitar <laughs> up on the, the front stage and say, and these people are asleep. But, brothers and sisters, you, you don't think I could be asleep, do you? I'm out doing self-supporting ministry. I'm standing in front of God's people on a regular basis, teaching them the prophetic message. I couldn't be asleep, could I? The fact of the matter is, is the prophetic testimony is that at the end of the world, God's people are asleep, and the sooner we admit that the Laodicean message is for us, 
the better off we're going to be. All right? and, and so what I'm saying is that this prophetic message is providing the prophetic arguments to demonstrate to anyone that's willing to just take a peek that Christ is finishing the work in the most holy place and probation is about to close. And in that sense, when you're identifying, and this is what we're going to be working on, is that on September 11, 2001, the third woe of the seventh trumpet arrived in history. The pioneer understanding of the third woe is this is the crisis that leads to the close of probation. Therefore, what we're saying is this is the punchline. There is no turning back now. The, the troublous times of Nehemiah are here, and the sealing of the 144,000 is about to begin. And this isn't intended, this, this understanding of prophecy is not intended to make us rejoice. It's intended to drive us to the foot of the cross, to do some self-examination, to make sure that we are in the right place at this time because there is no longer any time left to play around with sin. And, and because of that, what I'm saying is this prophetic message, it's, it's a parallel message to William Miller, to John the Baptist, to Noah, to, Mes to, to Moses, Elijah, all of those people. It is the first step in the work of the Holy Spirit to convince us of sin. If you and I can, will truly be convinced of sin and set aside the idols that are on our life, we will demonstrate righteousness, and the world will be convicted of righteousness too as they, as they look to us, and that's what Sister White says, the last warning to a dying world is a revelation of God's character. They're going to see God's character, his righteous character in his people if they will take the first step. So a lot of times people listen to what we're saying about prophecy, and they're, they walk away and they're convinced. They're willing to argue that this isn't the gospel, but brothers and sisters, the first step of the gospel is to be confronted with Christ and recognize your need of him. And this message is designed by the Holy Spirit to accomplish that. And the third step is to convince the world of judgment. So all of these reformatory movements, these, this three-step process of the Holy Spirit is clearly illustrated and we're suggesting that based upon, on several things, but upon the passage we read last night, when Sister White says that which follows the first and second message is to run parallel with it, is that just as William Miller's message went through history and then was empowered, that the third angel's message, which is our message, it went through history since 1844, and that when it becomes, when it is to be empowered, once again an angel is going to come down out of heaven and join it. And that's marking when it's empowered. But it's also marking when John eats the little book, which is marking a testing time begins. Um, and this is the testing time Sister White talks about in early writings, page 259. So we're, we're suggesting that the history of the Millerites is the blueprint for the history of our times. And we're suggesting that in Daniel 11, verse 40, you have the prediction of the collapse of the Soviet Union that is brought about by an alliance between the United States and the Vatican. And the fulfillment of this is identifying when the three-step process of the papacy returning to the throne of the earth has begun. Amen. One of the things that prophecy is governed on is a triple application of prophecy. Uh, if you look closely, many prophecies are, are illustrated in a triple form. And if you're going to understand modern Rome, modern Rome has been illustrated by pagan Rome and papal Rome. And in terms of taking control of the world, Daniel 8, verse 9, and Daniel 11, 16, and 17 teach that before pagan Rome took control of the world supremely, it had to overcome three geographical areas, Syria, Egypt, and Palestine. It's Daniel 8, 9, Daniel 11, verses 16 and 17. The third of those geographical areas was conquered in 31 BC. Egypt was defeated at the Battle of Actium in 31 BC. In Daniel 11, verse 24, when speaking about pagan Rome, says pagan Rome would rule the world for a time. And a time is 360 years. 
pagan Rome was to rule the world 360 years supremely. It took control of the world in 31 BC when it conquered the third of those geographical areas. And from 31 BC, if you add 360 years, you come to the year 330, which is the year that Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. And the point is this, in order for pagan Rome to take control of the world and rule it supremely, it first had to overcome three geographical obstacles. In order for papal Rome to take control of the world, it had to overcome three geographical obstacles, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Goths. It conquered the third, it defeated the third in the year 538. And when it conquered the third geographical area, just as pagan Rome, when it conquered the third geographical area, when papal Rome conquered the third geographical area, it ruled supremely for 1260 years. Upon the testimony of two, a thing is established. In order for, for Rome to take control of the world in Bible prophecy, it first has to conquer three geographical areas. Pagan Rome, that was the story. Papal Rome, was that, was that, that was the story. That's your two witnesses. Therefore, modern Rome, when it's going to conquer the world, when its, when its deadly wound is to be healed and is to return to the throne of the earth, it will have to overcome three geographical areas. Those areas are found in Daniel 11, verses 40 to 43. They are the king of the south, the glorious land, and Egypt. And Daniel 11.40, when the king of the south was swept away by the papacy, you know from Bible prophecy that the first movement for the papacy to return to the throne of the earth had been taken, and this was accomplished through an alliance with the United States. And according to Revelation 13, it is the United States that's going to force the world to accept the mark of the beast. It is the United States that's going to put the papacy on the throne of the earth. So in 1989, when the Soviet Union came down, there was a fulfillment of prophecy, Daniel 11:40, and it shed light upon the upcoming epic of sacred history. And this history is about how the papacy's deadly wound is healed and the mark of the beast is enforced upon all the world. So we're submitting that this was the time of the end for God's people here. And at that point, at the collapse of the Soviet Union, there began to be an increase of knowledge. They co there will come a time. This is the third angel's message. That's what the third angel's message is. The third angel's message is a warning against receiving the mark of the beast, which is going to be enforced by the United States, the papacy. This is the message that is to be empowered. And this message is empowered, we know, when the fourth angel of Revelation 18 joins it. So we're saying, because the seven thunders is teaching us that the Millerite history is repeated, that the empowerment of their message when the angel of Revelation 10 came down took place when the four great powers of Europe came together to decide the fate of Islam and restrain it. And we're saying that the number four represents worldwide, and that on September 11th, 2001, no matter who, no matter who attacked the Twin Towers, we still have to work through that one, of course, uh, at that point, George Bush went to the United Nations and said, we're now in a worldwide war with Islam, and the world has come together to put a restraint upon Islam, just as took place, took place back here. And brothers and sisters, once you see this and you begin to look closely at it, you realize that, that there are connections here that are strong. I mean, you can defend this biblically, historically, in ways that if you're hearing it for the first time, you wouldn't even think about. Let me give you an example. In this history, Egypt was attempting to conquer Turkey in order to reestablish an Islamic dynasty and carry on the warfare of Islam against Europe. That's the facts. That's, that's an agreement with pioneer, pioneer understanding. But, but did you know, if you look closely, Egypt, what Egypt had, it had the money. Okay, it had the money. But it didn't have, it didn't have the foot soldiers. And in this warfare that was restrained back here by the four great European powers, Egypt had formed an alliance with a group in Saudi Arabia that had agreed to be the foot soldiers of Egypt to reestablish the Islamic dynasty. And those foot soldiers in Saudi Arabia that had agreed to come together with Egypt to take control of Turkey, they were a group of religionists. You know what the name of their religion is? called Wahhabism. And brothers and sisters, it's Wahhabism that is the religion of Ben Laden. So you can trace, you can trace the religious <laughs> influence that's connected to what we're suggesting here, right back to here. It was here where the restraint was put on. Here's 
where it's reestablished. Um, so that's, that's just one, that's the first argument about Islam, all right? A another argument is in Revelation chapter 1. I will refer you to that. Already referred it to you before. There's a quote, we have it here. Perhaps most of us are familiar with it, where Sister White says, the Lord does not repeat things that are of no small significance. When something's repeated, it's important. And chapter 1 of Revelation, in some ways, is the most important chapter in the book of Revelation, in the sense that it sets, for, sets up the keys for us to interpret the rest of Revelation. And everything that Christ tells us about himself in chapter 1 has an impact on other passages in Revelation. And the thing that, that he teaches us more about himself in chapter 1 than any other, which is therefore the thing that he is emphasizing more than any other thing in chapter 1, prophetically, is that, as verse 11 says, he's the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. As verse 17 says, I am the first and the last. Um, in... Verse 19, it, speaking to John, he says, Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. And what he's saying is, write about the churches right now, the first Christian churches that were in existence then, because as you write about those first Christian churches, you're going to be writing about the end. He's the, the beginning, he's the end. And he's teaching this principle. And if you go to Isaiah 40 onward, as I said, and you read and you watch when Isaiah is referencing that Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and ending, or the Alpha Omega, you will find that the fact that Christ, one of the truths that, about Christ that he's the first and the last, is that he portrays the end of the world with the beginning of the world. And one of the important passages, for me at least, you'll find in Isaiah 44, Isaiah 44, when Isaiah is giving us some light on what it means that Christ is the first and the last, in verse 6 it says, Isaiah 44, verse 6, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And who as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. We must understand that the players in the book of Revelation, the symbols, the powers that are illustrated there, have been prefigured in the ancient people in past history. If you're going to understand Egypt, if you're going to understand spiritual Egypt in Revelation 11, you're going to have to understand ancient Israel, Egypt because that's how the Lord illustrates the end. He illustrates the end from the beginning. And if you go to Genesis 49, and I'm going to move very quickly through this argument, but this is an, arg this is an argument that we need to put in place. Sister White comments on it, but Genesis 49 says it plainly enough for us. In verse 1, it says, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you what shall befall you in the last days. And then you know if you read Genesis 49, this is where Jacob is pronouncing blessings, blessings upon his sons. But as verse 1 says, this is also predictions about the, roles that he, the role that his sons will play in the last days. But his sons, literal Israel, with well, the role they're going to play in the last days is going to prefigure what takes place with spiritual Israel. So the, the pronouncement here on Jacob's sons is a prophecy. It's, it's telling um, it's predicting the role of Israel at the end of the world. And the number 12, he had 12 sons. The number 12, if you run it through the Bible, and some numbers do represent truths in the Bible, um, the number 12 represents, among other things, God's kingdom. I mean, it's 12 sons of Jacob, 12 disciples, 12 gates into the city, 12 foundations, upon the testimony of two or three a thing is established. So when you see the number 12, that's a connection a reference, a connection somehow to God's kingdom. And who was Abraham's firstborn? Ishmael. And Ishmael was the father of how many princes? Twelve. Twelve. So there is a connection. There's a specific prophetic connection with Ishmael in Bible prophecy. He is the father of twelve sons, and he is Abraham's firstborn. I'm not saying that he's the inheritor of the covenant promises, but I am saying that there's also 
a prediction about the role of Ishmael's descendants in the last days because God is the one that appoints the ancient people to illustrate the end of the world. Now, now what I'm doing here, let me remind you of something. I'm on the verge of telling you that Islam, the descendants of Ishmael, and if you ask Ben Laden or any of his followers today, who is your father? They're either going to say Abraham or Ishmael. I mean, there's no argument. Ishmael is the father of Islam, or unless you want to say Abraham, but they don't argue it, so we shouldn't. And they are one of the ancient people that has been appointed by the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, to illustrate the end of the world. And we know they have some connection with God's kingdom by the number 12. So the Lord is in control of everything. The Lord, the Lord knew that every one of us were going to be in this room here today, a million years ago, whether we think about that on a regular basis or not. And he had the ability to have Ishmael have 11 sons or 13 sons, but Ishmael had 12 princes. So he's, he's giving us a prophetic marker. So in chapter 16 of Genesis, you will see a prediction about the role of the descendants of Ishmael in the last days. In verse 11, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. Now, this word wild, this is worth taking note of, this word wild, um, it's a... It's a wild donkey. You know, the Arabian donkey, the Arabian donkeys are beneficial in Arabia because they have the ability to smell water. You know, the, the caravans with the camels, they always have an Arabian donkey in front of them because they know that donkey, among other things, he's going to find the water. He's going to smell it. And, and so the Arabian donkey, which is called the wild donkey, is the, the word here that's translated as wild man. Why am I saying that? I'm saying this, that for this. And it comes to Ishmael, and this is a prophecy about Ishmael. One of the things that's associated with Ishmael is the horse, a donkey, a horse, that family. Okay? It, 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 you can see why I'm making this point. Revelation 9, when it comes to Islam, the symbol that, you, that represents Islam is the horse. Okay? The, so I'm saying the horse family is one of the characteristics of Ishmael in Bible prophecy. It's obvious that this isn't just my application. When the pioneers were going to symbolize Islam on these two charts that have been directed by the hand of the Lord, what do they use? They use a war horse, all right? So this word wild, he will be a wild man. This is a, a wild donkey of Arabia. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Now, I'll go through very quickly over this next part. What I'm saying first off is that Ishmael is, is one of the ancient people that has been appointed in Bible prophecy and his descendants are Islam and they are a subject of Bible prophecy. Um, Brother Rich, are you alright? It's Richard, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep you awake for this, alright? <laughs> uh, I don't, ha I don't think that I have to defend that Islam is a subject of prophecy because the pioneers of Adventism have already established that and Sister White in at least nine different places said they were correct. So, I mean, if, if you're struggling with what I'm saying about Islam being, having a role to play at the end of the world, then you're struggling against a foundational understanding that has been endorsed by Ellen White. They are a subject of prophecy. And as you track their, their relationship to God's people, it's twofold. It's a blessing and a curse. Classic example, I'm going to move real quick here. Numbers 22, Balaam is, is, can be understood as a symbol of Islam because Balaam came from the children of the East. And the children of the East is one of the phrases in the Old Testament that represents the descendants of Ishmael. And Balaam is hired to curse Israel, but all he can do is bless Israel. And you will find that one of the characteristics of Islam and Bible prophecy is that they are a blessing and a curse. And throughout Bible times, when Israel was in apostasy, the Lord would use up, raise up the descendants of Ishmael to bring judgment against Israel, a curse. All right, But they were also a blessing. They were used by the Lord to carry Joseph to safety out of the pit to Egypt. It was the Ishmaelite traders that did that. It was the wise men from the east that provided the funding for Joseph and Mary to carry uh, Christ into Egypt during the persecution. 
the these incense that are used in the sanctuary service are only grown in an area of Saudi Arabia which require that at all times Israel maintains an open trade relationship with the descendants of Ishmael, even if they had problems with them. If they were going to operate the sanctuary service, they had to buy those incense. So there was, the Lord always kept a connection to them. That's, that's Old Testament times. They're a blessing and a curse. In, in post-biblical times, they're going to bring warfare to the world against Europe. A curse, but at the same time, they wrap themselves around Europe, preventing the papacy from spreading around the world. They're a blessing. They restrain the papacy to Europe. Um, they are those, their educational centers were the centers that preserved the received text of the Bible that we get the King James Version from. The Lord used them providentially to be the ones that preserved the received text. And if you read Martin Luther, he will tell you that the deliverer of the Protestant Reformation was Islam because every time the Pope sent an army to snuff out the reformers, Islam would come down out of the north and the armies would have to reverse themselves and go defend against the, is, the invasion of Islam. So Islam has been a blessing and a curse. That's one of its characteristics all the way through history, a prophetic characteristic. We need to understand that because this is also identified in the first woe and therefore it will be part of the third woe. Um, so, let's, with that in mind, with that the fact that Islam is uh, a subject of Bible prophecy already established by the, the pioneers of Adventism, let me turn to my notes and let's start taking up some of these other considerations of Islam. I suppose a good place to start is a triple application of prophecy. Usually people are unfamiliar with what I'm saying on a triple application of prophecy. I'll, I'll give you a couple examples of that so you can see what I'm contending about a triple application of prophecy. There are some prophecies in the Bible. I've, meant, I've, I've mentioned one already here in this presentation. The characteristics of pagan Rome combined with the characteristics of papal Rome establish the characteristics of modern Rome upon the testimony of two things established. In a triple application of prophecy, when you're dealing with a triple application of prophecy, one of the internal rules in this particular principle is that the first two times the prophecy is fulfilled will establish and identify the characteristic of the third and final fulfillment. And one of the, the simple ways to illustrate this, a trip, how a triple application of prophecy works is through the triple application of the three Elijahs. Elijah the first, John the Baptist is Elijah the second. Um, and one of the rules of a triple application of prophecy is it's always going to teach you something about Rome. Rome is always a component of a triple application of prophecy. And in the story of Elijah, he had to deal with the threefold enemy. He had to deal with an impure woman, Jezebel, <clears throat> that was in an unlawful relationship with the king, Ahab, and the prophets of Baal that did the dance of deception. Elijah had to deal with a threefold power, an impure woman pointing forward to the papacy at the end of the world, a civil power pointing forward to the ten kings of Revelation 17, the United Nations, and the prophets of Baal did the dance of deception, the United States, the false prophet. The, there's much to say about this. I'm not, dealing with, I'm not dealing with Elijah here now. I'm simply trying to illustrate how a triple application of prophecy works. The second Elijah is John the Baptist. Christ told us so. And he had to deal with an impure woman, Herodias, that once again is in an unlawful marriage with a civil power, Herod. And, so, and Herodias' daughter, Salome, does the dance of deception. The prophets of Baal dance around the altar all day long trying to deceive the people. Salome dances before Herodias and all his friends to deceive them. The third power does the dance of deception. The second power is a civil power, a king. A king is a civil power in Bible prophecy. And the, both these kings are married to an impure woman. It's an unlawful relationship. This is, the, this is illustrating for us that at the end of the world, during the time period of the third Elijah, 
that we're going to have to deal with an impure woman, the Catholic Church, that comes into a church-state relationship with the United Nations, a world civil power, and the world's going to accept this arrangement because the United States is going to force them to do so. It's going to do the dance of deception. All of this, the, all the characteristics of the third Elijah, have been established in the first two Elijahs. A triple application of prophecy. The first time the prophecy is fulfilled, the characteristics of this story, combined with the characteristics of this line of prophecy, establish the characteristics of the third and final fulfillment. All right, that's a triple application of prophecy. Pretty easy to see, right? Amen? Okay. And there, by the way, I'm certain that you could, could do uh, at least two hours, maybe three hours, just dealing with Elijah. I'm, I'm not denying that I'm, I'm walking away from a lot of light here that can be generated from the three Elijahs, but I'm simply trying to show how a triple application of prophecy works. Now, in Revelation 8 through 11, you have the seven trumpets. And as we've said, the seven trumpets, according to the pioneers, according to the Bible, and the pioneers understood and uh, wrote this in their writings and taught this, the trumpets represent the historical forces that bring down Rome. In chapter 8, um, the first trumpet uh, in verse 6 is Alaric, uh, one of the barbarians. In verse 8, the second trumpet ends Genseric out of North Africa, the Vandals. Um, chapter, or verse 10, Attila the Hun is the third trumpet, another barbarian out of Northern Europe. Um, the fourth trumpet in verse 12, Odiacer. The first four trumpets bring to a conclusion Western Rome, and I think I've been saying 427 for the record, 476. Everyone remember me saying 427 yesterday? It doesn't, it's 476, it's not going to impact anything we were saying anyway. But by 476, these first four trumpets had brought warfare against Western Rome so that from the year 476 onward, there was never an Italian that was ruling the city of Rome any longer. Western Rome had come to a conclusion under the first four trumpets, and that's what the pioneers taught. And when the pioneers taught that the trumpets represent the the bringing down of a kingdom, the providential forces that bring down a kingdom, but they applied this all to Rome here, where do you suppose their first biblical reference is? Jericho. They go to the story of Jericho. There's other biblical references, but they're saying a trumpet symbolizes the bringing down of a kingdom, but these trumpets, it's how Rome is brought down. The first four trumpets bring down Western Rome by 476. And in verse 13 of chapter 8, after the first four trumpets, it says, And I beheld and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe! to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So what I want you to see here is of the seven trumpets, it is the book of Revelation that identifies the last three trumpets as three woes. So what I'm suggesting to you is it's the book of Revelation that is setting aside the last three trumpets and saying these are three woes and therefore they are to be um, understood in agreement with the triple application of prophecy. I'm telling you out front that right now I'm not going to give you all the characteristics of the first and second woe. There's other things to say. I'm going to keep this brief, but I'm going to tell you that the, the, la, the three woes, the fifth, sixth, seventh trumpet, are also a triple application of prophecy. And if you take the characteristics as the pioneers identify them, as history confirms, as is illustrated in the Bible, if you take the characteristics of the first and the second woe, you will establish the characteristics of the third. Whoa, okay. So, but as I put the characteristics up here, I'm leaving some out. It's not going to impact what we're going to teach you, nor is it going to deceive you in any way. It's just some of the things I'm leaving out, you have to take a little bit more time to explain, all right? So be forewarned, if you ask me something later, well, wasn't the first will this, the second will that? I probably could say yes, but we didn't need to see it. The first woe the pioneers understood was Islam, descendants of Ishmael. And the historical figure, you notice with the first four trumpets, I gave you four historical figures, uh, Alaric, uh, Genseric, Attila the Hun, and Odiacer. 
the historical figure associated with the first woe is Muhammad. This is the time period when Muhammad comes into history around 610 and begins his short ministry. Um, Islam in the first woe, what it's being portrayed as, is attacking, bringing warfare, the armies of Rome. And its style of warfare is identified. You know, there's a lot of different styles of warfare. Uh, the, the British used to line up in a line with bright coats and march straight at you, all right? That's a type of warfare. But Islam, its style of warfare is identified in the Bible and confirmed in history that they would attack suddenly and unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. Yeah, that's good enough. I'm not trying to deceive you. I'll be out front. My spelling is weak, all right? So uh, against the, they would strike suddenly and unexpectedly. They would, they'd come up over the sand dune on their Arabian horses, and they would chop someone's head off, and before the blood was flowing, they'd be over the other sand dune. And, and that's what's described um, in this passage for Islam. Um, should be looking at my notes because I'm about to probably to leave something all out, and I'd rather not have to jump back to you to it for you. Um, um, in, in the first world, they were going to hurt Rome. They were going to hurt Rome. We can put that one in there. Where in the second world, they were going to kill Rome. Rome. That has an application here at the end. Um, Okay, and, and they were directed by their tails. Both, both woes are directed by their tails, it says. And in Isaiah 9.15, it says, The ancient and the honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. So their armies were going to be controlled and directed by the spiritual leaders that would stay back in the mosque. Like, like who's this guy? Sadr. Sadr in Iraq. You know, the, the heavyset uh, leader that's sets back in the mosque or goes to Iran and directs it. Same, same story. They were directed by their tales, which is the prophet that teaches lies. That's, that's the first woe. In agreement with the pioneer understanding, in which I think we should uphold. It's what's on this chart that was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. The second woe was Islam. Now, this was, the first woe was Islam of Arabia. Arabia, and this is Islam of Turkey, different cultures, same religion. Um, it's also telling about the warfare that they bring against the armies of Rome. So they also are attacking the armies of Rome, and the, the mode of warfare for Islam in the second woe is identical. They would strike suddenly and unexpectedly, but there's a difference in the history of the second woe the, the first significant battle of the Second Woe is 1453, when Islam blows down the walls of Constantinople and kills, kills Eastern Rome, brings it to an end. That's what it says. Rome would be killed here in this history. And the way they did that, the very first time in history that gunpowder was used in warfare, it was used by Islam to blow down the walls of Constantinople in 1453. So there... Their mode of warfare in the second world was that they attacked suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. So, although I know that many of you may not be familiar with testing triple applications of prophecy, there are more than we've mentioned here, but when you do test them, you'll see that when a prophecy is fulfilled three times in Bible prophecy, the first two times that it's fulfilled, the characteristics of the first fulfillment combined with the characteristics of the second fulfillment will establish the characteristics of the third and final fulfillment. Therefore, based upon a triple application of prophecy, when the third woe arrives in history, it will be Islam. By the way, the historical figure associated with the Second world was Ottoman, of the Ottoman Empire. It will be Islam. 
uh, but it will be worldwide Islam. Islam in that time period of the first and second world was divided into two geographical areas, Arabia and Turkey, two different cultures, two different areas. But when you bring these two together, and it's representing worldwide, this is going to be worldwide Islam, what they will do is attack the armies of Rome. And brothers and sisters, at the end of the world that we're living, prophetically, who's the armies of Rome? They will attack the armies, or the USA. How will they attack? They're going to attack them suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. And brothers and sisters, that's not just 9-11. It's going on almost every day. Some Islamic terrorists will walk into a room like this, and without anyone knowing it, suddenly and unexpectedly, he's going to blow himself up. And you know what? He's been directed by the tales, by the prophets that teach his lies, those imams that are back in the mosque pulling the strings on all this. The, the prophetic testimony is just absolutely crystal clear to what's going on today. So what we're saying is that on September 11th, 2001, the third woe arrived. This is, this is just a second argument along this line. The first is that it parallels this history here. Because at this point in time, Islam attacked the armies of Rome suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives, and the third woe arrived in history. Now, now I know the argument every time, okay? And I know it's already on your mind, so we're going to go there. Brother Jeff, why are you so foolish? to think that it is Islam that attacked the Twin Towers. Haven't you seen all the DVDs? Uh, haven't you listened to some of the other speakers? Uh, first off, personally, I am that foolish. I'm, I'll tell you out front. I put most of my, my confidence in the fact that it was Islam. But we don't have to argue here, brothers and sisters. This truth is so important that the Lord puts it beyond any argument on this particular subject. In Revelation 9, all right, you have the first and second woe. Before the second woe, the sixth trumpet is concluded, you have Revelation 10. And in Revelation 10, when the mighty angel comes down on August 11th, 1840, you're seeing a history of the Millerites that is connected directly with the sixth trumpet. I mean, the fulfillment of this time prophecy of 391 years and 15 days is the time prophecy of the second woe. So Revelation 10 is con continuing the testimony about the second woe, all right? And by the way, just for the, for the sake of clarity, the pioneers believe that the second woe, the sixth trumpet, began on August 11, 1840, and the pioneers are wrong. And I understood the pioneers were wrong for, uh, for quite a while based on prophecy, all right? And, but, you know, you know if, you're, if you're not teaching, if you're a voice saying, we need to go back to the pioneer positions, if you find a pioneer position that's wrong, you've got to be careful about what you're saying, and you're really going to alienate your crowd. Uh, it, so I've taken some heat on that, but, but there's some prophetic reasons we haven't got time to look at why I came to the conclusion that the, that the sixth trumpet had to end on October 22nd, 1844. And I was in Germany a few years ago, and this, this wacko guy, all right, I'll just keep it in my own terminology. He was, had a bunch of crazy questions. And so I'd already said to myself, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this brother because he's already taken a lot of time on just a bunch of foolishness. And you, you know people like that. So he came to me and he says, what do you do with William Foy's quote where he says in 1842 that the sixth trumpet has not yet sounded? And I didn't take any time with him because I just said, oh, come on, give me a break. Then we went to a camp meeting in Switzerland, and there was a really what appeared to be a balanced, sincere, quiet, humble guy. He says, what do you do with the quote where William Foy says that the sixth trumpet hasn't sounded in 1842? And I, at that point, I says, well, I'll have to find that out. So I went back to my room, and I got on the Pioneer CD-ROM, <clears throat> and William Foy, who the pioneers identified, and I hope you understand, had the, was given the spirit of prophecy. If you, don't, if you don't believe that he had the genuine spirit of prophecy, you're standing in opposition to the pioneers because as the pioneers explained the spirit of prophecy as being active in Sister White, 
they would go to William Foy and Hazen Foss to uphold it. That if both those people were given the spirit of prophecy, but it ended up with Sister White. And in 1842, he had a vision that he went in and had recorded where he says, the angel told me in 1842 that the sixth trumpet had not yet done, had not yet done sounding. And it's broken English like that because of he, he, that's how he wrote. Is a, is a black man, mulatto man, in that history he spoke in the blo broken English of a black man. But what he was saying in 1842, what the angel said to him, is the sixth trumpet had not yet finished sounding. And when it got translated into the German language over there, whoever translated it, mistranslated it. And I realized in my room, hey, well, these Germans that want to put the sixth trumpet at the end of the world, whoever translated that, translated that incorrectly. And every time you go over here, you, there you have to deal with this false translation. But in 1842, William Foy, under inspiration, was told that the sixth trumpet had not yet finished sounding. I found this out after I had concluded for myself that it ended in 1844. Okay, so it, it, it ends here. And then, uh, where was I going with all this? Okay, so the, the chapter 10 is, is more information about the sixth trumpet, but then look at chapter 11, verse 14. In verse 14 of chapter 11, it says, The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The second woe, the sixth trumpet, does not end prophetically until verse 14 of chapter 11, which means that prophetically we have to include the history of the French Revolution in the second woe. And what I'm going to share with you when we come back from our break is that the power that's bringing down Rome in the French Revolution time period, atheistic France, it's the dragon power. So the second woe consists of two powers bring, that are going to work together to bring down Rome, Islam, and the dragon power. And the dragon power today is these globalists, the United Nations, the CIA, George Bush, whatever you want to call them. So when you use a triple application of prophecy, and you bring them together, and you make your conclusion about September 11, 2001, and you say, uh, at that point, Islam struck suddenly and unexpected with explosives, and everyone says, no, 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 you haven't seen the DVDs. This was the globalist. What I'm saying is that Bible prophecy leaves room to see the influence of the dragon in the second woe. Therefore, you can see the dragon involved in this attack on September 11, 2001. So this is not an argument. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for bringing us here together at this time. We ask that you would make this time spent this weekend beneficial to all that have been here. That you would have us understand these things correctly. And if they are true, once we test them through study and prayer, we ask that you give us the wisdom and discernment on how to teach this message to those around us. Give the warning message that the work might be finished and that we might leave this world of sin and go home with you soon. We ask that you give us um, some refreshment in a short break that we might come and continue on. We thank you for doing these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>